Hi, I'm Jorge El Bosque. I am a PhD candidate under the Media and Arts Technology program at Queen Mary University of London. In this master class, we will have an introduction on speech interfaces. We will look into the main components of them. We will have a look on the research agenda and we will see some practical tools that you could use in your creative pipes. Thanks, hola. A stick mul emocionat. That's all my Catalan. I think it wasn't a very good pronunciation, but uh, I, I, um, I tried. Um, I feel great to be here at Sonar Plus Z in this creativity, technology, and business. Um, I feel part of this community. Um, since the year 2000, I created my first startup. I designed a learning management system, um, which I sold to different companies. Then I created an interior design system that sold to companies in Italy, Mexico, Colombia, Canada. Then I created another company uh, which gave consulting on how to create corporate universities. And then the last company I, cre I created is a digital agency. So I started my career um, as an entrepreneur, and then I was in the need of science. I wanted to be a researcher, I wanted to do a PhD, so I moved to London, and I'm currently halfway uh, my PhD. So a lot of the things that you are going to see here are the result of the last three years of my um, experience. I want, you, I want to connect with, with the practical things so that you can go back to your uh, homes, back to um, your production studios, back to um, your, uh, the places where you create music, where you code, where you make, um, back to your companies, even if you are a nine-to-fiver. Any nine-to-fiver here with a regular job? There you go. Excellent. Congratulations for being here. It's half conceptual, it's half practical, and I created a Git GitHub uh, repository in which you can download all the things that I'm going to show. Um, so you can uh, send me a direct message on Twitter or on Instagram, and I can share you that link. So I want to inspire you. I want to give you things that you can use to implant ideas in your brains. Don't worry. I'll remain here so I won't put any subdermal chips or anything. It's just the ideas that I want you to take with you. This is uh, some examples of uh, recent work. So I hacked this poor Teletubby and played with Arduino and Max MSP. Um, and this Teletubby reacted to your voice. If you were happy or sad, it will sort of like show you positive or negative emotions uh, in the videos or with his uh, lights there. And then the eyes moved. It was really, really creepy and fun also. Uh, but this was sort of like my first experiments into and how voice affects emotions, how we can relate to machines or objects um, with our voice, and how to identify some emo emotions and sentiments. This is another project, so I designed this touch board, I called it, um, which is um, you can change this interface and use different buttons, in this case to control Logic Pro, um, in this one, in this case to paint, um, so this is one of the um, human-computer interaction projects I've done recently, uh, sort of like a sketch. So this is uh, the things that I've been doing recently, um, a couple of years ago when I started my PhD. And I will show you on episode seven, because this talk or master class, I see it as uh, season one. So we're going to have different episodes along the whole master class. And I will start with a bold statement. The current speech-enabled interfaces, Alexa, Google Home, Cortana, are far from conversational. They just provide us ways of activating simple commands li like start a timer, open YouTube, do this, do that. It's sort of like a 
just simple commands. So you cannot have an actual conversation less, like, like we humans do. So best case scenario, they repeat Wikipedia pages. Let's see how Siri does this. Hey Siri, what's an international space station? The International Space Station is a space station or a habitable artificial satellite in low Earth orbit. Do you want me to keep reading? No, thank you. Okay, that's something. Do you want me to keep reading? That's something. If you ask this question like maybe six months ago or a year ago, it would just keep going and going and going and going until you shout at it. Now let's see um, Alexa. What's an international space station? The International Space Station is a space station or a habitable artificial satellite in low Earth orbit. Okay, that's another example. Now my favorite, Cortana from Microsoft. What is an international space station? Here is what I found. Here is what I found. So it's like you go to the corner store, you want something, you ask the cashier, do you have this? And they say, that is what we have. So really, really bad customer service. So these are the things that I'm researching and am very deep into psycholinguistics, which is a branch of linguistics that it's related to metaphors, blended concepts, analogies, all of these complicated things um, that we humans do in a very natural way, which I think that speech interfaces and conversational user interfaces should be able to be compatible with. They should be able to communicate with us in that way, and we should be able to be assisted by them, by these psycholinguistics devices. And part of on episode three or four, I will go deeper into these psycholinguistics and other scientific fields that are related to speech interfaces. Another new technolo technological feature of speech interfaces, which we humans use all the time when we speak with someone, is the ability to ask follow-up questions and keep talking about the same topic. Let's listen to the Google Home Mini. Hey Google, is it going to rain today? No, it's not forecast to rain today in London. It'll be partly cloudy, with a forecast high of 22 and a low of 13. Hey Google, what about tomorrow? No, it won't rain in London tomorrow. It'll be partly cloudy, with a high of 26 and a low of 16. That's something also like six months ago or a year ago, if you would say, what about tomorrow? It will say something like, I don't have that song in your Spotify. Something like that. So, um, with 5G around the corner and with full duplex communications, which means simultaneously, like we humans, when I talk, you listen to me, and if you're talking simultaneously, I can still listen to you. So that's why people can talk simultaneously and respond in a very agile way. So with 5G around the corner and with people, um, with the AirPods or EarPods connected every day and with the assistants um, with them, I predict that conversational AI is going to be even more pervasive with all of this new technology. Technology algorithms and networks are getting better and better and making the conversations with the smart devices more fluid and effortless. So this masterclass has a very rich agenda, and it's very packed. Let's go to the next topic. So these devices are pervasively inundating our life, our phones, our watches, our cars, public spaces, even toilets. Yes, toilets. This is on a recent trip from London to Glasgow. Job. You know, I used to be in public. 
the toilet, and let me tell you, this is a step up. Uh, anyway, yeah. carry on. Okay, it's like if you're going to a toilet, I mean, you want to be relaxed, at least myself. I don't want to be like laughing or that stuff. So this, is a, this was a little bit weird, um, creepy, strange, like you listen to this actor, you don't know if, if it's there, if it's not. So industry and scientists need to think more about how to use these speech interactions. Otherwise, strange things like this could happen. So I'm also glad I picked up this research on my PhD because there's a lot to do to make these things better. Now, let's have a deeper look into the different components that these machines have. I want to make the distinction of the artificial intelligence we're talking about when we speak about speech interfaces. But before that, I needed to have a more like a forest view or a helicopter view. And let me say that the full spectrum of human intelligence is still undeciphered. Neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, psychologists, and other scientists are far from understanding how our brain works in its full capacity. Even though artificial intelligence has grown massively with increased capacity of the hardware, the availability of massive amounts of data that can be used to train machines, and with the rebirth of the neural network's algorithms, which is um, where the coolest things are happening now, in spite of all of this, there is still a lot of work to do to keep emulating just some of the cognitive skills we have as humans. So let's go to the episode two of this season one of conversational AI. Let's have a look to this diagram. We can see four big blocks here. Machine vision, machine listening, robotics, and machine cognition. I want you to share this simplified model so that you can go back and keep doing your artistic practice or your creative practice or your company or whatever you are doing and planning to exploit speech interfaces, you can be able to map whatever new thing you absorb. So just make this simple analogy. It's like vision, and then listening, and then thinking. So that's super simplified, but it's going to help you. Machine vision, it allows cars to differentiate, to distinguish between a bicycle and a person. Machine vision also can read your gestures and your face and can determine if you are bored, entertained, surprised, or whatever um, gesture you are um, you have in your face. Machine listening. There are examples uh, like Shazam, which I'm sure you all know, or Warbler, which was developed by Dan Stowell at Queen Mary University of London in the Center for Digital Music. So this is an application that is like the Shazam for birds. So you listen to the birds, and it tells you which bird you are listening to. So that's machine listening. Machine listening also separates words from music. When you're talking to these devices like the Google Home Mini or the Alexa or even your phone, when you're talking to them, if there is background music, Algorithms are able to separate in different layers and just understand the words. So that's part of machine li <coughs> listening. Then robotics. Um, so this is a performance uh, at a concert in Ars Electronica. So there's uh, contemporary dancers. And uh, we can see the robot here performing as well. So that's just an example of robotics. Of course, everyone knows about the boring application of robots building cars. But I think this is more fun and interesting. So that's the robotics part of artificial intelligence. Machine cognition. There's knowledge reasoning, natural language processing, and then machine learning. Again, it's an oversimplification. You can categorize machine learning in a separate place because machine learning actually touches all of the areas. Um, so knowledge reasoning, there is uh, the IBM Watson, for example, which assists doctors and uh, to diagnose symptoms. 
So with knowledge reasoning, you can have access to hundreds and thousands of records of previous diagnosis, so doctors are able to give a better diagnose when they have a new patient. Natural language processing, which is also known as computational linguistics, and it's, I would say, one of the most important areas which uh, are related to conversational AI. Natural language processing also allows these things to happen. If you search in the Google bar, then you have these predictions. They create these language models that create these predictions. Bing, if you search for Sonar 2019, then it will give you predictions of the following word that you will say, like lineup or anti-mine, dates, tickets. As you can see, they show different predictions because these algorithms are created by different researchers or um, programmers or scientists, and also they have different data sets. Of course, Google has a big amount of data that is populating this, the results of these algorithms. So now that we have a complete panorama of artificial intelligence, let's go into the nuts and bolts of speech interfaces. Conversational AI or speech-enabled interfaces, they are modular. It's like a clock that has different components. So for them, these four big components would be the automatic speech recognition, the natural language processing module, the dialogue management module, and the text-to-speech module. The automatic speech recognition is the part that converts the audio signal into a transcript or into a chain of words or a string. So from an audio signal to a string. The natural language processing module is the one that once the transcript is there, you separate the words in adjectives, nouns, verbs, um, and other types of classification so that the dialogue manager can strategize and decide like we do it while we have a conversation. The dialogue manager is the one that, first of all, it identifies, OK, was that a question? Then I have to respond. Was that a statement? Then I have to interpret it in a different way. Was that a back channel? A back channel are things like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, like this things that uh, we thought they are not important in the past, but are super important in the grounding processes of communication. So the dialogue manager is the one that decides what to do in the dialogue. And then there is a connection here. The dialogue manager also connects to APIs. For example, in that case that I talked about, Watson accessing different medical records. So the API would go to that database and then construct a response. And finally, the text-to-speech component is the one that converts the response, the transcript that the, that the system has created, and it, convert, it synthesizes a voice so that the, the person can, can listen to, 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 the, to the voice. OK, so what was the purpose of this? episode of the components of a conversational AI for you to understand what's inside these devices and what's inside these technologies that you can use in your creative practices and to connect them to your production pipelines or to your composition projects as musicians or artists. And I will start with psycholinguistics, which is my favorite and it's the field that I'm currently working on. So part of my job as a researcher is to analyze manually conversations of people, talking, couples, planning trips, friends catching up, people at pubs um, or bars, um, tutors explaining things. So, so, so that's part of my job now, so that I can understand what they are doing, that these things are not doing, that should be doing, and then experiment and try and test. What do we have here? Let's, let's uh, give some examples of metaphors that we use. The heart of the issue, heart of a stone, heart of a lion. 
the hat trick, pass the hat, hat in hand. All of these are idioms, expressions. Eyes wide open, jaw dropping, brush off. So we use all of these expressions and metaphors, and computers should be able to understand and use them. Psycholinguistics also looks into the phenomenon of conceptual blending, like this example. Take a fish and a discotheque, and there you go, you have a fish tech. So not really good news for the fish, but for the hungry people, it's great news to have a fish tech. Or take this other example, Café del Mar, which some of you might know, and Lower Marsh Street at London, you have Café del Mar. I just like it. So that's psycholinguistics. That was metaphors. That was conceptual blending. Let's listen to a couple of examples. Just one example, briefly, uh, from the British National Corpus, which is a data set that is yeah, available to scientific and research. The, um, I think I, I will... Uh, extroverts are people we're not listening to all of it. I will explain it. So, so what I wanted to uh, highlight here is that they are using... They talk about a day out in Scarborough. So Scarborough, if you are not from UK, you don't know what is it, right? The York Moors, also, you don't know what is it. So this means that to relate to someone, you have to have this common ground. Otherwise, there's no meaning. This is a picture of a restaurant called Cubana, also at Lower March Street. And I like this, this image because it resembles a little bit of like a window to possibly one or more Cubans brain. So there is religious figures. There is, uh, I think, Fidel Castro, revolutionary weapons. So all of that things are inside our brain. And we use them while we communicate with others. Let's take a step back and just mention about the other fields, which are sort of like sisters or brothers to psycholinguistics, like pragmatics. So pragmatics deals with the gestures like moving the hand or pointing here. So I'm creating meaning by pointing here. It's not just what I'm saying. The gestures, um, the position, like if you have your hands like this or if you have your hands like this, that's also creating meaning. So that's Pragmatics, semantics. Semantics deals with the meaning of the words. Psycholinguistics, we talked about it, and then phonology. So phonology is the sounds of every word and how also they impact in our communication. And then cognitive science. Cognitive science draws from philosophy, psychology, linguistics, and neuroscience which uh, also measures your brain waves while you talk or for the conversational AI fields. There's researchers also measuring the brain waves and looking into them to determine what happens when you say something with a specific emotion or with other emotion or when you are creating a new concept, for example. And then computer science, it's also one of the fields that is very important, of course, to conversational AI, because it encompasses the dialogue systems, the natural language processing, and the sound and voice synthesis subfields. And finally, sound and music cognition, like psychoacoustics. So this branch studies why we feel happy or sad when we listen to certain songs, when there is a progression of, a chord, of chords that starts from the low range to the high range, and then you feel happy or the opposite. You feel sad if the progression is the other way. And finally, human-computer interaction, which it encompasses all type of interaction with computers, in this case for conversational interfaces, the speech interaction. All of those fields are relevant for the things that we are going to see in this video. I'm Q, the world's first genderless voice assistant. Think of me like Siri or Alexa, but neither male nor female. I'm created for a future where we are no longer defined by gender, but rather how we define ourselves. My voice was recorded by people who neither identify as male nor female, and then altered to sound gender neutral, putting my voice between 145 and 175 hertz, 
a range defined by audio researchers. But for me to become a third option for voice assistance, I need your help. Share my voice with Apple, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. And together we can ensure that technology recognizes us all. Thanks for listening. Q. So what is really interesting and what I'm passionate about as well is this uh, multidisciplinary nature of the field. So you need to understand all of these fields in order to evolve these interfaces. Now, just to summarize, linguistics, cognitive science, computer science, sound and music cognition, and human-computer interactions. Those are the fields related to conversational AI. So now that we have the full, a full perspective, I will continue to the next episode, which are the tools. I will create a GitHub repo where you can download the things that I will show you so that we can advance in a faster way and also that you can use some scripts that you can later use. So if you want to develop actions for, for, for the Google ecosystem, this is the place to start. So developing actions on Google, and they have a lot of ways in which you can start creating them. Not just with Google, but for example, with Dialogflow, I created a tutorial that you can follow step by step, and it's really, really, really fast and very easy to create these interactions. For example, in this, you create an intent. This is like a sonar app, and you add the questions like, which days does catnap perform, or when is catnap playing? And then you create the answers, and then you can deploy this action in a Google Assistant in, a, in your cell phone, or you can put it directly in your Google Home, and then you can start playing with it and maybe sampling that phrases and mixing them or doing whatever cool stuff you want to do with it. There's going to be this, uh, in, in that website that I will create for this masterclass, you can download this tutorial and you can follow this uh, step by step. Designguidelines.withgoogle.com, it's also a great way to start to develop these applications for the Google ecosystem. Then we also have the Amazon Alexa ecosystem and tools. This is a very nice application that you can use online. It's called getstoryline.com. Of course, the developer console from Amazon. Then the echoism.io, which is a simulator in case you don't have this application, this uh, hard the Echo hardware. The Amazon Lex, a sort of like a robust API that you can connect to corporate applications or to access directly the Amazon libraries. Amazon Poly, which is voice synthesis part of the Amazon family of voice technologies and products. Voice Flow, which is for both for Alexa and for the Google Home. So there's a lot of ways in which you can start creating these applications uh, via coding or even without code. Watson Bluemix, this is a demo in which you can just talk. It will transcribe your voice, and it will tell you how many, like the frequency of words you use, and it will do some natural language processing there for you. You can also upload audio files and get the transcription. This is from IBM. Lyrebird, to create your own vocal avatar. So you just start reading and you start training this thing, and then there's this voice that is created, um, like your voice. These are some examples of my voice. I am recently having a recurring dream in which I live in an apartment that has a huge pool. Well, it's like, I don't think it's like my voice, but I just train it for three minutes. But if you keep going and going, in a future life, I would like to be a woman, just to try something else. Why not? And then Vocaloid, which is a virtual singer. I don't know if you know Hatsume Niku. I, maybe I pronounce it wrongly, but it's, it's a virtual singer that is very famous. So the voice was created by Yamaha's Vocaloid. You, you just put the transcript there, and this application sings for you, and then you can move the notes and you can also incorporate these vocals into your production pipeline. 
and then uh, hum on, which is an uh, application in which you hum or ta -da -da, and then it creates music for you that you can then sample and then you can you do a lot of creative things that you want to do. So that was the section of the tools. Now I'll go to the favorite episode, which is unspoken work. The unspoken word project. So I created the unspoken word project with Lizzie Wilson. She's an electronic musician and performs as digital selves. And she's a researcher at the Center for Digital Music, or C4DM, at Queen Mary University of London. And we collaborated with Tim Cowlishow, which is here, uh, <laughs> and with Henry Cook um, to create. Uh, it all started with their idea of singing with machines. So they inspired us by saying, OK, just think about singing with machines. So we built the software that converts spoken word into music and soundscape. This is the first conceptual sketch uh, we built. So the idea was to take the, spoken, the universe of spoken word to this, one of these devices, like haiku poems. Haiku, it's a form of Japanese uh, poetry. Or take lyrics, poems, tweets, news, scripts, whatever. And then analyze all of those semantic, all of those uh, linguistic features, like sentiment, the grammar, the semantics, analogies, pitch, prosody. Extract those features there and then feed a generative algorithm that will create a soundscape or a music composition that you could perform live if you'd like. So that's the initial sketch. That was the idea. And this came out as a result. So this installation, we built it for the uh, Arts Electronica Festival last year, and we exhibited there. And people used it. They experimented with it. There were people from a lot of countries, and they were speaking in Chinese and German. So we had to tell them, you have to speak in English, otherwise it wouldn't recognize. So there's an area of opportunity of these installations and devices. There should be like international by default. So you should just speak the language you want to speak, and it sh they should recognize the language. Let's see it in action. Deep wounds that leave scars. One moment, much more must flow. Shadows from the soul. So that's a haiku poem. There's a transcript. There is, it's detecting the nouns, the adjectives, and then it brings out sort of like a console, then you can start mixing samples from free sound and uh, virtual instruments that Super Collider was, uh, were uh, playing. So we did some experimental research with the system and tested with around 12 people with musical skills. And this is a short mix of what they created. Of course, that's the happiness, the circus.
One more example. This is just a phrase. Robots can do bad things. How are you today? I am a robot. How are you today? I am a robot. How are you? All right. What just happened here? We're going to share all of these scripts so you can also use them and you can play with this. It all starts by reciting a poem or a phrase. And we created a three-step feature extraction process, which detects the nature of the sentiment, if it's positive or negative, and then the intensity, like a severe depression or an extreme happiness, right? So that's why at the beginning it was more like sort of like a happy mood, and then it was like a more like a dark, like a very depressed thing. So the second step, we use the nouns and adjectives to query the free sound library by means of, the, of, an API, of the, their API. For those of you who haven't heard about free sound, free sound is an initiative of the music technology group at Universitat Pompeu Fabra here in Barcelona that contains more than 400,000 samples and sounds. The third st step is really interesting. I, I train a machine learning classifier um, using a NLTK with Python. I will share that script as well. I fed the model with concreteness ratings. I will share also the link to the data set that you can also use to train your model. So we use, inspired by the animacy concept, which it's a measure of how entities are alive or are not alive. You have the categories of humans, like humans, gods, and ghosts. You have organizations like companies and bands intelligent machines like robots, animals, concrete, non-concrete, vehicles and places. So, inspired by these animacy categories, we selected concrete and non-concrete, and these were the mappings that we used. So, from linguistic features to musical features, we took the sentiment and we mapped it to tonality, intensity to the key center, concreteness to the timbre of the instrument, and nouns and adjectives to the sound samples uh, from free sound. So I will explain you briefly with this diagram. So you start talking, there's a Flask server that sends everything to the core. The core uploads to the Google Cloud speech-to-text API, gets the transcription back. The transcription is sent again to another Google Cloud API and it brings back the sentiment and the magnitude. Then it goes to the, to the machine learning classifier using the naive base algorithm, and we get, we get the concreteness ratings um, of the nouns and the adjectives. And we create this package of the words, the sentiment, the intensity, the, and the concreteness ratings in an OSC message, and we send it to Super Collider. All of this was uh, programmed by Lisa Wilson. And uh, so with, 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 with this data package, she created a generative algorithm that fits the mixing interfaces and also queries the FreeSound library and brings the audio files. And then you can, you can mix the different channels of the, of the music. So that's how we created a tool that could be used as a springboard to generate more ideas or create soundscapes and sound art or even make, part, make it part of your music composition process. You can use these tools to do your stuff and to connect it to whatever you are doing. Um, I, I also coded another script that takes the same words and then send it to the processing software and then creates visuals with queries Google images and it, it, it puts also images that from the spoken word. So you can also create uh, visuals with it. So in this master class, just a short summary of what we covered. Introduction to AI related to conversational AI, components of the speech interfaces, the science behind the tools,
and the Unspoken Word project. So make sure to send me a direct message if you want access to the code, to the examples, to the tutorials. And thank you very much. Gracias. And I think we have time for questions and answers. Hi there. Thank you very much for the talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, I'm a writer and a story designer looking into the uses of AI in entertainment, but also in therapy. And I was wondering, what are your thoughts about that kind of use of conversational AI to do relationship management or also therapeutic relationship management? Oh, it's an amazing application and it's growing. It's a growing field um, because while we talk, a lot of things happen in our brain. So my specialty is on tutoring systems. So I'm going to go into how we can use this stuff so that machines can explain people and explain in an effective way. Um, so mental health is, is not my uh, specialty, but in my dialogue research group, mm -hmm. so it's Shamaila and Mortessa. Uh, the three of us are being uh, advised by Julian Hoff, which is part of the uh, cognitive science group. So Shamaila, she is working with uh, dementia. So she's analyzing. Remember I was telling you about these scripts of Scarborough and that. So she, she's computationally and using neural networks to analyze how people with mental health issues um, converse or talk. So the first step is to detect it. So that's the first step. But the next step would be, given the fact that we have a diagnose of someone with mental health, how we can create models that can help these people to release anxieties or to have a, very, or to have a better quality of life. So that's like a big answer, but in short, I would say that there is very promising or promising field which is growing a lot, yes. And I can share you more. If you send me an email, I can share you more information about it. That would be amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great talk again. Thank you. So uh, for the companies, what would you think are the biggest barriers to adopt more conversational experiences? So there's two ways of responding this or there's two branches of this question. Companies for their employees or companies for as the consumer market. So which, which part of this question do you want? Right, so yeah, as, so for the consumer market, the challenge, so, so for Apple, for Google, for the companies that are building these products, the challenge is to incorporate multilingual capabilities. The challenge is to increase the data sets in different genders and languages because there is a bias in the algorithms now. There is a bias in, the, in, in a lot of the algorithms in different fields. They are biased because most of the data is being captured from white people or white men. So if you don't have voices of women, if you don't have voices of black people or people of different uh, races or backgrounds, then these things, they're going to be dysfunctional. So that's the challenge for them. The challenge for, and then the other part is, I think that I would rephrase the question as how would corporations can make use of voice applications f um, for their employees? And particularly, what's the challenges? So for example, companies that are recruiting people with AI tools, they are also facing these challenges of thinking that an AI is going to discriminate you, or how come you put a machine to make me an interview so I'm more valuable than talking to a machine, right? So those are the kind of challenges that I see. Is that a little bit of the answer? All right. Um, one more question. Yes. Thank you. Um, I have two questions, but maybe they are similar. If you are investigating, researching on one of the most annoying thing is that we call these devices to activate them. 
hey Google, hey Siri, and so on. And the, se the, s the following step uh, is always even more annoying. <laughs> like when you want to narrow a request and you have to repeat, hey Google, and, and so on. So are, yes. are, you, are you investigating or finding smart ways to, to avoid this, this step? Yeah, I think it's it's uh, you are right, and it's 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 really cha challenging because for that to occur, these things should be listening to us all the time. So there is a privacy concern. So I think that we have to come to a future in which we don't give our data <laughs> so that these things can operate. Like, where is the Cortana that I have? I think in other device. I had to reset that device because for Cortana to work, you need, it's, it's mandatory to give your contacts. It's like, okay, you want to use Cortana? I need your contact. Why do you need my contacts? I, I'm not even going to call them. I want to use that feature, right? So I reset that iPhone and I have the Cortana there. So the privacy is very important. I would feel more comfortable if I'm not sharing any data, so all needs to work in the hardware. It doesn't have to go to the cloud. The moment it goes to the cloud, which is secure, it's really public because we know that anyone can hack anything. So there's no guarantee that that data is there. So let me go back to, uh, so we need to these things to be listening all the time. So nowadays, what these companies say these things do is that they just listen to the wake up word, right? So they are just listening to this Hey Google, Alexa. They are just listening to that, which is, I mean, it's a great narrative, but paradoxically, or maybe it's an oxymoron, or I don't know how to categorize that in an euphemistic way. That thing needs to go into the cloud. So in a sense, it's there, everything you say, right? So you can put it, you can, you can, you can put, state it differently. So one challenge is to listen all the time. And I think it's going to come at some point so that you can keep talking. And just as a person, like th these things also would be great. Like you can gaze, look at them and, hey, can you tell me that again, please? or if you want to use please or not, right? So, so when you look at them, they know. Or if you do like, like this, it's like it just quits. Or if you do like, you do with people like, carry on, come on, like, go. So they should speak faster, for example. Um, but as I was saying in the talk, with 5G, uh, this is, this is going to cha change massively. And I don't know when full duplex is coming, but that's when I see these things really, really working better. Um, did, did I respond? Yeah, oh. and th the next question that you you answered uh, for, uh, I mean, was when we will see them the devices activate by themselves when they trigger that we they have something interesting to tell. I mean, like, like hey, during the day, for example, it's like, hey, hey Jorge is gonna rain, right? That looks pretty, like, kind of not very complex. It's just like a feature. Like, for example, uh, you can also have messages and calls. Like, if you order something from Amazon, it's going to show like a light. It's showing a light when it arrives. You get a message that it's there. So I'm sure that it's going it's, it's to come like, it's, it, it's, it's, we are close to that, because it's just a matter of configuring it, like, talk to me in this condition or this condition or this condition. Right? Thank you. All right. One more question. And, and uh, what about uh, personal recognition, a trusted personal recognition? Right. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. What is the state of the art uh, to a voice, let me say, a voice fingerprint? So is it Siri? I just configured one. I think it's Siri. No, this one. Um, you can, you can actually have different people. Like if you live with uh, your partner or your kids, um, you can 
program, you can, you can record the voices. So you train, you do a little bit of training, you say, hey, everyone says, hey, Google, in individual sessions. So you will have separate conversations. So that's there, it's here, and that's now, at least with, with the Google Home, right? Is that, did I answer? Or were you asking something? I thought in a more uh, secure level. Uh, perhaps not the bank, but uh, a serious business uh, transaction uh, that uh, in, uh, perhaps uh, in, in a legal uh, consequence of that. If I purchase uh, with your machine, uh, how can you uh, be sure that uh, you, are, you are, not, are not me? Right. In, 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 a, in, a, in a more serious step, I thought. Right, it's, yeah, so, uh, yeah, and there are stories, like the BBC actually did some, they have, a, uh, like, in their click program, they showed this documentary in which people break into houses, they hack the TV, and then the TV plays a voice that says, open the door, <laughs> and then the door gets open, and then uh, thieves come in and uh, rob the house. Right, so, so the research should go into the voice fingerprints, uh, but again, it's challenging because it touches privacy, and we know that there's always data breaches, and I wouldn't want my voice or my fingerprints. Um, like, well, actually, I think my fingerprints are already there because of the, some government, like, just was attacked, but uh, so we're going there, and it's challenging because of privacy. Right. <laughs> uh, in your projects and research, you rely a lot on, in, on IPIs and Google services or Amazon Web Services, and how do you feel about uh, working with the, the cloud instead yes. of working with open toolkits, open source toolkits, yeah. or in-house yeah. software developed right. by yourself? So, so we use all of them. We, we, we use also open source. For example, we use the um, Stanford NLP core, which is, has been coded by Stanford University, and it does very good computational linguistics, linguistics analysis, and it's implemented in Java. We use that. We use the NLTK. Natural Language Processing Toolkit um, within Python um, and other like the Scikit-Learn, we also use it. So we use um, all of them, particularly for on spoken word. I use them because I love that they have a very active community. So there's a lot of support there, particularly from the Google Cloud. There's a big community, well documented. You can go fast. So for prototyping and research, um, I personally use everything. Um, but I would say that in academia, in general, um, people prefer open source. Um, but since I've been in industry, like in my previous years, um, I'm sort of like agnostic. Like, yeah, I use whatever helps me the best. Is that a good answer? Yeah, but uh, I mean that uh, you, you rely on the on the internet with a connection. If you want, if you for uh, automatic speech recognition, yes, you you, you need to access the cloud. If yes, the internet doesn't work, then you you are right. Out. Yes. So if these things were to operate independently, you are right. You need to make the things. You need to code the things and make them work in the hardware. So it's going to depend on where you're going to use it. Definitely. Yeah. One last question. So I've been involved in a lot of projects where we would collect data and for machine learning, and there's always an issue with the standards for like, how do you structure the data. If you can just share if you have any tips or resources with the proper guidelines, what should be the standard for storing, uh, so for example, the sample, the voice samples, the structure of the data? If if I have a data set, you know, with the, you know, as I progress, I have a lot of conversational 
AI yeah. data from like, yeah. from the past? How do I structure it? If there's any global guide? Yeah, so I would recommend you to check the British National Corpus website and you will find uh, they have XML files which have a structure and and uh, that that would be a good starting point but it's going to depend a lot in the use you are going to make of them one of the very important things that i'm looking into is something called the dialogue act i was commenting about when you say something is that a statement is that a back channel is that a why question which type of question all of those things and there is an iso standard of this dialogue act but there are also dozens of different taxonomies and I'm developing my own one because it fits the purpose of my research. So you have to have a balanced um, perspective and use the standards when, when, when you have to use them and, be, and create your own when you, have to, when you have to do it. But just to go back uh, to what is there, I think that the British National Corpus, it's a good example of standardizing the data. And I can send you some links if you direct message me. Yeah. Yeah, another question. Yeah, my question would be, um, these devices will be ubiquitous. Yes. And um, I think in time, they will change the way we, we talk, <laughs> we speak. Yeah. Because, for example, they are very present in houses and already children interact with them and it just changes the way they, they relate and the way they start to communicate. For example, a child will not be, is not usually, um, does not have an Alexa in the house usually, but he goes somewhere in a holiday, he's present and then he sees, you can say, Alexa pizza. And then he changes the way he talks to his family. And yes. I think this will happen. Yes. How will this affect us and are there any eth ethic concern because right. they will change they will change hierarchies in communication and so on i think like that's a very interesting question and uh, technology changes how people behave right so nowadays this morning that i was having my breakfast so there was someone on the queue which had like the his played here and then was like tweeting and chatting. So in the past, it was like you would chat or smile or say something. So now it's a barrier there. So society evolves because of technology. The kids, if parents give them iPads, and now I'm sure you've seen a kid like maybe live or in a video or whatever, that when they see like a big screen, they just, they just go and do, do, they do this, the kids, because they are used to the iPad, you have to tell them that no. An interesting thing that companies have started to do, I think it's Amazon, I'm not sure if it's Amazon or Google, but they introduce this sort of like politeness. You have to say please and thank you, right? So I think that companies that, that are experimenting with, I'm not saying that, should be, that it should be like that. What I'm saying is that companies that take the risk of incorporating these um, features in their devices, uh, I think it's great that they should keep doing it. And uh, that's, that's a good example of how companies, these companies, like the, the manufacturers of this, like play a definitive role in how people change their behavior. So I foresee that since the public is more ethical, aware, and is being more active, and being and pressuring governments and, and, and Google and Facebook and Amazon and all of the big companies. Um, they, I foresee that they will respond, and that's that's my vision. I think I think it's going to be a positive future in that in that uh, area. <laughs> is that did I answer kind of? Yes. Hi, thank you. Uh, just for the sake of curiosity, have yeah. you put two of those devices to speak to each yeah. other? And <laughs> how far the conversation goes? Well, <laughs> it ju I didn't do it on purpose. It was accidental. Le like, yeah, it was accidental. And uh, also, 
So it just goes for two or three interactions. But there is a video there in YouTube that you can see them talk to each other. So you can code a skill here and an action here. And you can make them to keep talking and talking and talking. Yeah, <laughs> it's really fun. Well, it can go endless. Yes, it's endless. You can create a loop as well. I think people have done like loops. So it will go again and again and again and again. Yeah. OK, thank you very much again. <laughs>